Hello, so here we are again in my house. Everyone's gone to bed. I've got some quiet time here this evening. And there's been a thought running through my head most of the day. You know, yesterday I, I started a kind of outline of the, the whole idea of moving down a road. Um, we're all going towards the door of death. I mean, there's no way to avoid that. We're, we are, uh, one way or another, we're going to get to that gate. One of the key things about any faith, I believe, is, is the manner in which you travel that road. And also it provides a pretty interesting uh, way to do it. So I'm going to tell you a little story, and then I'm going to ask you a powerful question at the end of it. In 2012, I published Austria Book of Days, which still sells every month. The second book I wrote was The Divine Feminine in Austria. It was kind of a Jungian analysis of the uh, Norse feminine archetypes. The third one I wrote was a book about Loki. At that time, I was uh, I reached out to a couple of people. You know, there's always somebody that seems to be, you know, on top of their game. I said, well, look what I, I've written this. Let's see what you think about it. If you like it, give me a little review, blah, blah, blah. You know, you got to do a bunch of marketing. You can't just write a book and throw it out there. Nobody will ever buy it. You got to keep it in front of their faces. You got to market it. You got to tell people what you've written <laughs> because there's a lot of options. What most people don't realize is that option typically means, oh, they've written the same thing they've got out of the pros ed or they've put it in a different way and they've called it their own. The uh, thing about Loki was is that it, it was a uh, it was a very clear identification in the lore of what happens when a man's ego gets out of control. And the problem with most of what we see on social media is there is there are no boundaries for the ego of men. And when I say ego, I mean that outer proportion sense of self you create in your mind, that idea that you have in your head of who and what you are. See, the thing about Loki is that he, there are two instances where he shows up where he cannot stand, absolutely cannot stand, the attention that someone else is getting instead of him. And since he's not the center of attention at Eager's Feast, he kills the servant. Kills him outright and they run him off. Then he comes back in claiming rights of hospitality to come in and sit down and, and then proceed to insult the rest of the divine being sitting at the table with him, sitting there proving to all the world that he has no understanding of how the divine interacts with each other, acting like the uninspired human intellect trying to bring it all down to his level so he can feel cool about things, so he can provide the justification for his shitty behavior. He ends up bound to the rock, doesn't he? And yet, you know, you still see people talking about, oh, he's edgy and cool, and it's like the bad boy, and there might be something a little naughty about me if I'm kind of on that side. And it just, I look at that stuff, and it just makes me laugh. Now, the other instance is the death of Balder. There's an important lesson in that, too. So he, he, he continues on his ways. He uh, so thoroughly upset that Balder's getting all this attention and he's not getting any. And the important thing about ego is, is that most of the time people that are boosting their ego, they don't have to do anything to boost it. All they got to do is think about it and talk about it or poke fun at someone else and show how much they are not that way and make themselves feel a little bit more important about themselves. It's probably one of the most corrosive, destructive threads that runs through the evolution of humanity that you can find. And here we find in our Norse mythology, in our lore, in Ossetru, a very clear outline of what it looks like when someone acts like that and what it does to the society that tolerates the existence of that being. So what he does, instead of taking action himself, he goes to the edge of the crowd. He goes to the crippled individual who's not really a part of the goings-on of the main event. He's not sitting there, part he's kind of on the outskirts, he's kind of by himself, like so many other fringe elements we see in society. Convinced of how right they are, how much of a victim they are, 
and they get a little whisper in their ear and they take a shot at the center of the crowd and they steal the light from the rest of the world. This whole idea that Loki might be something worth venerating, that he might be something worth following. If you read carefully through that book, or many of the books that I've read, uh, The Drink from Memer's Well, or um, uh, Life and the Love of Life, I've got a real clear outline there of just exactly what it means, what he represents. He's not the trickster god. We didn't take that from some Native American idea of the coyote. He's the uninspired human intellect. He's the person that's so full of himself, he believes his ideas are right, and he's going to do it his own way. In fact, even when the creation of the monsters that destroy the world, he decides that even though he has a girlfriend, Sigyn, the one who suffers at his side now, he decides to sneak off from the woods and hook up with some hag and create these monsters that destroy the world. The snake, Yomengondor, and the Fenris wolf. Hell is something entirely different. She's a she's a much older goddess than that, and I think there's a little confusion there. I think that's one of the few key points where we can really say that there was an outside influence on what Snorri wrote. Though he was the presiding judge of the All Thing, and being the presiding judge of the All Thing in Iceland at that time, I'm sure he had a, a profound knowledge of how to run that society, or how it should be run based on all of this lore. So. You can go either way with that one. A lot of people want to argue it. I'm not interested in the argument. You know. <laughs> but the key thing about all of this with Loki is that, he, you know, he's he's, the, he's that uninspired human intellect. And he looks so much like we do when we present ourselves like fools on social media talking about what we think we know or how things ought to be. And Loki goes off in the woods, hooks up with this hag and... and um, creates an idea, a mentality, a concept, however you want to perceive it, and it's what eventually destroys the world. How many people do that? It's like a drunk redneck in any trailer park that's, you know, had a 12-pack of beer, and now all of a sudden he's he's taking a red pill, and he's woke, and he's got an idea, and he's, my God, he, he. now the conspiracy theories filter through his mind at an unimpeded rate. All of a sudden he feels like he knows something, oh, hey, that's the whole point of a conspiracy theory. I know a little something you don't know. I'm a little bit more important than you are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly how that works. See, there's no way to prove it. There's no winning. There's no upside. Once you buy into that conspiracy theory, the sole purpose of that thing existing in your life is that you might know something somebody else doesn't know. Therefore, you're a little bit important, even though you haven't done a single thing to make yourself better than the man next to you. You haven't educated yourself or made yourself more physically fit or undergone any kind of uh, therapy or treatment or, or worked on any kind of emotional state of being that you have. You haven't earned the rights to stand in front of the troops. You haven't you know, conditioned yourself or to be physically fit or any of these other things um like i say a lot of times it's a drunk in a trailer park or you know maybe it's an, a working alcoholic maybe it's a guy that can function in society but he, but he drinks a a liter and a half of tequila every night but he knows something you don't he might not ever have to do anything again he's got a little something he knows a little something got something going on here I mean, you know let me let you in on a little secret our ancestors pointed that whole mindset out thousands of years ago using the example of Loki to do it. And if you don't believe it, pick up a book and read it. Pick up my books and read it and see if I don't make the legitimate point of what I'm talking about. You see, we've got to, we're going to move down this road. You want to be a pathfinder? You want to jump into the forest and clear an LZ for where you want to land and where you want to go? Well, you've got an identifying objective. <laughs> but here's the thing. You jump into an LZ, you have to do the work. You can't sit there and talk about a conspiracy theory or how it would be if they would adopt this form of government or that form of government or anything else. You are the one that has to do that work. 
You are the one that has to do that personal growth. You are the one that has to sacrifice those ideas, those, those concepts that you have of yourself, of how great you are, set them to the side and realize, look here, I've got a road to travel. There's no need to be carrying that baggage. And yet every single day, billions of people the world over in the big three of monotheistic religions will ask for forgiveness for some failure they refuse to let go of. How many times will they ask for forgiveness for something they did 20 years ago? They refuse to set it to the side. And instead of handling the mindset would put them in that situation to begin with and growing and taking responsibility for it, which is the also true way, we may not ever get forgiveness. But you can be damn sure we're going to do our best not to find ourselves in that same situation again. Because we're going to stand there. We're going to be honest about it. We're going to stand on our own two feet. And we're going to accept the responsibility for it. Isn't that a part of being also true? At least that's the way I believe it. See, I don't feel like carrying that stuff around anymore. I don't feel like carrying around that automatic train of thought telling me how great I was and the stats I had on the football team or what I did in the army or the businesses that I built. What do you think that really matters? What do you think that any of that really matters right here, right now? See, we got to get some of this stuff in perspective. This constant feeding of, of information into our minds of how important we are or how great we are is leading to bloated, outlandishly sized egos that have absolutely nothing to do with moving us forward and doing the real work of becoming a powerful, spiritually balanced, emotionally healthy, physically fit and strong and heathen. The kind of men our ancestors had the potential to be. We find ourselves in a world where people are more interested in creating something to feel important about than they are in actually doing the work to become something important. See, we've all got that potential. But so does that great big rock on top of the mountain, and it ain't going to do a damn thing until somebody pushes it. I see a lot of people subscribing to the idea of heathenry. They can kick back, take a hot bath, put a little sage in it, and burn some candles, get some cool pictures, and make a meme, and they're heathen. It didn't cost them anything to be a part of it. I think Chris Jockio pointed that out to me years ago. It didn't cost them a thing to be a part of it. Now all of a sudden they're heathen. And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of action that goes with being ossetry. It means you are taking responsibility for your growth and development. That means you are identifying those concepts and ideas in the lore that will help move you forward. You see, because for thousands of years, during the long months of winter, the people in our culture would sit around a fire and an elder of the village would tell these children these tales. Do you think they told them to keep them happy, keep them busy? That was a form of instruction so those individuals, those kids, could grow up and become meaningful, powerful, strong, beneficial members of that tribe so that it might survive. Whether or not we realize it time and time and time again on this planet, it has been characterized by huge catastrophic events that have literally wiped out 95% of the species that have existed on this planet. It has brought men down quite a few times. Another thing I write about in great detail on life, the love of life. And in case you don't know, that is Leif and Leif or Seer. Those are the two that emerge from the tree after the Ragnarok. <laughs> when you emerge from the personal Ragnarok that brought you to the crossroads where you decided to change the spiritual foundation of your being. It might behoove you to begin to take a look at some of the things that brought you to that crossroads to begin with. And I would submit to you that if you are honest with yourself and you have the courage necessary to take a good long look at who and what you are, 
you will find that ego is one of the biggest things that brought you to that crossroads. An out of control, out of whack, out of balanced image and perception of yourself. We have a chance to change that. We have a chance to live a life of also true that, really, that really and truly has the potential to provide the moral compass for the entire world. To begin to take responsibility for our actions and quit sitting here saying, oh, well, there's an intercessor and he says I can have forgiveness. It doesn't matter the damage that I've caused. It doesn't matter the wounds that I've inflicted on all of the people around me to make myself feel important or justify how important they are. And they can't disrespect me and I'm, I'm, I'm important. Those people can do whatever they want to. If you want to be important, if you want to live up to that, if you want to be that image that you have in your mind of yourself, you do the hard work necessary to get there. You jump into that LZ, you build it, you lay it all out, you get it cleared out, and then you figure out where your objective is and how you want to travel that path to the road of death. Now, having said all that, I got another question for you. In the time that you sat here, listening to me talk about a few things. How much money did your money make you? And if you don't know that answer, you might take a look because there's probably a credit card somewhere that's costing you money. Most people only have one source of income, the job. They trade their time for someone else's dollars. Some people do it with extraordinary skill and enjoy an amazing amount of success with it because the world benefits what they can achieve. But to really move forward in this world, to find yourself in that place where you can focus on these concepts that I'm talking about, it might behoove you to begin looking at how you can make that money that you worked so hard to earn work for you. I'll be addressing a couple of ideas and suggestions and things that I personally do with money that I earn to help me make it through times when I'm laid off or not working or it's whatever for the holidays, for a vacation I want to go on, for you know some clothes I want to buy for my for my little girl or my grandchildren or my wife. You know, those kinds of things are important. So think about that. How much money is your money making you? while you sit here and try to move forward with regards to your spirit. Hmm. I assure you, if you can get both of them going for you in your direction, the direction that you choose, life changes 110%. And here's the thing, it doesn't have to stop changing either. It can continue to get better. Isn't that the whole point of all of this? Isn't that the point of all of this? Things are going to be better for us. That we'll be able to walk out of our front door every morning with our head held high, our chest stuck out, a pocket full of money, and take on anything the world might have to throw at us. Let them. Y'all have a great day.